uh, here's the sidewalk and here's the chosen path that people take yeah. down the grass. If, if you yeah. hadn't brought that up, I was going to bring it up. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. The classic thing is that people, if you don't, if you put them on a rail that they don't like, they are going to find a different way to do it, uh, whether you like it or not. There is a whole bunch of content in, in the enterprise that people shouldn't even know exists. We're waiting for the industry to catch up to us. You're talking about the empowerment of the individual yeah. over the empowerment of the establishment. I really liked your, your invention. <laughs> Uh, the intellectual invention of the security defragmentation. Right. It is, it's a metaphor, but it actually is technically accurate as well. Uh, I mean, you could talk a little bit about uh, packaging up the techniques that we're going to use mm -hmm. of, our, of, our, of our software, of the strategy across the systems. I, don't, I'm, I refrain from calling it a platform anymore or a suite because it goes to where you are, you don't have to build on top of it. I want to be very careful about that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how we're packaging up these ideas and uh, maybe how different that is just from here's a platform and you can do a bunch of stuff with it. Now you, the burden is on you as a customer to make the decision. The application or the applications of, uh, of having a total understanding of your data across everything, across your file system, across shares and repositories and uh, databases, the, the applications kind of spill out of that understanding. So if, if you work from our, 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 our fundamental premise that our goal is to, to understand all of it, everything you've got, not just some sliver of data that you've put in a content repository called everything a record that's in there and forgotten about the other 80 or 90 or 95% of the data on your system. But if you, if you embrace an understanding of the totality of your data, the applications kind of spill out of that from our perspective. And so, you know, we were talking about the security uh, defragmentation. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the sort of universal truths that have developed that, that has developed over the last, you know, 15 or 20 or 30, 30 years is that companies are really, really everyone, they're all terrible. Every one of them is terrible uh, at managing the permissions of files and documents on network shares and network drives and that kind of thing. And it, it, it what ends up happening if you go to the properties page of any file on your, on your system and you look at the permissions for that file over time, it becomes this soup of, you know, maybe it starts off looking, the permissions and uh, access control lists start off looking okay. But over the years, what happens is Joe gets permission and then Sally needs, and Joe needs uh, total permission over it and Sally needs read and write. And then Sally leaves the company. And so she's, she's still on the permission list, but she's not there anymore. And what ends up happening is that each of the files and, 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 and documents in your system end up incredibly fragmented and this is one of the this is one of the pieces that spills out of that to say look you know gosh you know before before we do anything else let's clean this up this is a this is a dog's breakfast as part of our normal uh, uh, plan for just dealing and wrangling all this data, maybe it's going to go live somewhere else. Maybe we're going to uh, do some records management on it. You're going to do some attribution. Let's at least get the security story for it straight. And once you've got that security story straight, you're already in a better posture. If you've, if you've done only that, that's already a giant improvement from a situation where uh, Joe, who used to be in finance, has full full permission over uh, salaries.xls or something. You know, you know, Joe moves on to marketing, even though he used to be in finance, but he's still got permissions for a for a salary Excel document, for example. Um, which we, you know, we we know that that's a thing. We know that that happens, and um, and our tools are built to 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 help you clean that up. It, and it reminds me, uh, and we have to be careful here because obviously we overlap and previous lives, but it's, I'm, I'm going to tell a story that you probably, you maybe remember <laughs> and uh, let's not name any names or any organization. Oh, now I'm, I'm dying to hear what this is. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's just right. assume that there was a big repository that had been alive since the start of time for a big organization. Yeah. Not a shared drive, but an enterprise content management sure. repository and a new person was onboarded as the new webmaster of the company. So that's how right. far back we're gone. And that new person decided, well, I'm going to give myself 
pull permissions to everything in this enterprise content management repository. As the webmaster, I need to have permission. As the webmaster, because they were a global admin. Right. So they went and made themselves the owner of every piece of content in the whole system. But uh, I looked at this, who the heck is this person? I, I, I knew their name. Who is this? Because they just screwed up a lot of stuff for my group, and I'm assuming a lot of other groups. And it was this weird situation where uh, IT didn't want to go to a backup because yeah. that means that we would have lost a whole day or two or three's worth of work yeah. because nobody noticed this overnight and there was a whole lots of time until finally yeah, so somebody, so there was thousands of changes in the system that the they recovery would go point back would be way too forward. Long, yeah. mm -hmm. So it was a manual effort to go undo this and clean it up. And it was that dog's breakfast that you're describing of mm -hmm. why does, does who has permit go clean up your own permissions. Whereas if you have the technique that you're describing, uh, we have rules that say if Davey's currently in product management, then he yeah. gets the product product management sphere. And right. if Jason's in, in sales, then he gets the sales sphere and it applies the permissions based upon your roles in the content, not based upon the whims of particular individuals at particular points in time and then it lives yeah. forever. And I'm just imagining that that's, that's a circumstance that would have clearly solved that problem immediately. Just run the security defrag again and boom, it's all back to normal as opposed to this manual. It's because that took, it literally took actually years to recover yeah, from it. I'm, and I I'm bet sure. you if we go in there, there's still some objects that shouldn't be owned by that individual that remnants free than are. Right. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, it, what a mess, what a, what a mess. And oh, what a disaster, what a potential disaster. I mean, you're talking about, a uh, situation where somebody who's a a, a loyal uh, you know uh, a loyal employee. What if that's a bad actor? What if that's the wrong person? Right. I mean, that's that could have been an absolute disaster. But the other one that that I often think about that sort of um, parallels this whole conversation. There's a whole bunch of content in uh, in the enterprise that people shouldn't even know exists. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not sufficient to simply lock it down so that somebody can't edit it or, 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 or read it. Um, it's, they cannot know that that document exists. A document called layoffs.docx, you know, uh, list, of, list of terminated uh, employees to be terminated, dot doc. And, and I think that's, that's another big problem when we're talking about security and we're talking about access and control of these objects is that you want to build into this um, thinking um, the understanding that you are not going to make everybody a records manager. This idea that was popular in the to early 2000s and, and, and after, you know, after Enron and after, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and all these things, this idea that you're suddenly going to turn 50,000 people in an enormous company into records managers, forget it. They, they, cannot, they cannot have that even enter their brain as something that they have to worry about. They're engineers, they're they're, you know, they're, uh, they're technical people, they're uh, knowledge workers, they're whatever, they, they're not, they have not been hired to be your records manager. So the system itself has to be much more sophisticated and clever about that. Can we all agree that we're not going to get everybody to change their behavior just for the benefit of having a better content retrieval and understanding right. practice? Uh, if we can do that, then that automatically disqualifies a bunch of behaviors. Yeah. And unfortunately, a bunch of those behaviors are stuff that are like magic quadrant leaders and wave leaders and stuff right. like that, who aren't really solving the problem at the scale that we need. But people just, they, yeah, th yeah it's, they're not ready to be a, what I will call an informed consumer. Yeah. An informed consumer is going to say, no, you're not going to. I see why this is in your best interest. Uh, I don't. I don't want to make these things about picking on particular vendors, but I, Apple's an easy target. It's. I've got an Apple device sitting right beside me here. Like yeah. it's. I'm a fan of a lot of the things that they do, but there's certain thing behaviors that are just insufferable. Lightning connectors and dongles for everything. <laughs> yeah. Dongles for days, and it's yeah. just of no benefit for me. Because they're not making anything better than Thunderbolt or USB-C or whatever. Just yeah. stop it with the $30 dongle. And 
there's so yeah. many behaviors of big companies in the content services that are it's just the thirty dollar dongle of those systems. Uh, yeah. Like it's yeah, you're not allowed to use AutoCAD. You have to use our viewer. Right. Like that's the thirty dollar dongle. No, I want to use the app that's built by the company who has like Bentley or AutoCAD or these guys who own this space. No, no, don't use that. Use our thing. And these types of things are uh, the, if we truly hold up as an informed consumer and say, all of my applications, I want to use the best of breed for my application. Right. And I will be intolerant of somebody who comes along and says, no, 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 break that whole way of thinking and just use this other thing because of the convenience you are going to convince all your users to change for the benefit of records management. When it, it's almost reducto absurd at absurdum yeah. when you position it that way, but it's what the industry's doing. Yeah, and you're you're getting in the way of people getting their job done. You're getting in the way of user adoption. You're it's it's absolutely a contributing factor to why some of these uh, projects fail. Um, because people don't buy into it. You, you've introduced something to their lives and to their jobs that actually uh, hampers their efficiency, gets in the way of them getting things done. And then you've immediately created a user or possibly several thousand users who are not with you, they're against you. The more that you can be completely invisible uh, to, to users, the better. Let the, just don't get in the way of them. They've got some stuff to do. As I said, they're, they're engineers and doctors and lawyers and the like. They, they're not, they didn't sign on to be document managers or records managers. Just let me get my work done. I've got stuff to do. I've got to think about building a bridge or a nuclear power plant or something like that. I don't want to, I don't want to learn about records management. I just want to, just want to do my job. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about the empowerment of the individual. Yeah. over the empowerment of the establishment. What the establishment wants to do is nice, good for the establishment. They want you to fill in a form before you can save a file. Right. Maybe you'll do it, maybe you won't. But when you are booking that flight, when you are doing all those consumer activities, you have the choice. Mm -hmm. Do I want the web experience? Do I want the app experience? Do I want to deal directly with a vendor or do I want to do an aggregator who's done some comparison shopping for me? Mm -hmm. There is, there is an ergonomic experience that you can choose. And that choicefulness as an individual is extremely powerful. And even if we, we bring that, that, uh, you know, that, th that type of web experience to the enterprise, you still don't get the individual choicefulness. Yeah. You're still on a rail and you have yeah. to, you want to do this task, you got to go this way. And organizations aren't really building in the feedback loop of, of uh, and it's that classic, uh, here's the sidewalk and here's the chosen path that people take yeah. down the grass. If, if you yeah. hadn't brought that up, I was going to bring it up. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. It, is, yeah. it is the classic thing is that people, if you don't, if you put them on a rail that they don't like, they are going to find a different way to do it, uh, whether you like it or not. So it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not only the good experience that's going to attract users, but it's also the choicefulness It's the fact that you need to go where the users are. Don't make them come to you with a better icon or a faster website. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, to me, this this feeds right back into, you know, uh, taking an, a, an agile or iter iterative approach to how you deploy these solutions um, uh, to, to your users is that, you know, it should be the kind of thing that, you know, f first off, it, it's a great it's a great experience and people love using it but you're not necessarily done. You know, it should be this, this cycle where, you know, you release something to your users, a, you know, a, a discovery search is a great example in my opinion, where, you know, if, if, you know, one of the biggest barriers that we know exists in a lot of enterprises is the ability to quickly find uh, the, the information you're looking for, the document you're looking for, particularly across multiple systems. So, you know, whether it's a kind of a federated search or a search across multiple systems at the, you know, in, in, in chunks or, or shards, um, you know, we know that that's a problem. If you can quickly introduce uh, a solution that really makes that a much more pleasant experience, good stuff, bully for you, put, put one in the win column, but you're not done. That, that's, a, that's an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we've made your life a little bit better um, because before you were going to nine different systems and you had to log into each of them and, you know, and they each had different search interfaces and different search syntaxes and it was a real pain. 
you've given you've given me a place where I can do that, you know, kind of uh, in aggregate very quickly. What else can you do? You know, and 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 that's where I think it's going to become really interesting is the way in which, as a result of a of a discovery search, you can then act make make actions uh, come from what you found, right? Um, you know, it, maybe it's uh, some kind of document review function, maybe it's some other other process that you want to kick off as a result of what you've been searching for. Um, and that's, you know, that's where our customers and the feedback loop that we, that we have with them is going to be so important and so interesting because, you know, you're, you're not done, you know, you're not done with your first delivery. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I have used with some customers before. I remind them that the project that we're doing for an implementation, yeah. getting it in front of their users is a race to the start line. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great yeah. analogy. Yeah, or even think it's like we're doing the training, we're doing the Rocky montage right now, yeah. but it's fight day is when you really get to show off. Like it's whatever metaphor you want is that it's we're not we're just trying to get to the start, and then the work begins of, yeah. of really realizing the value. The model that we have of of really bringing customers along on that journey with us is so powerful because at some point or another a little light bulb goes off ahead of time, and people buy into the approach. They buy into the idea that, um, you know, that there are no crazy ideas. Well, you know, there, there are some that are, you know, ambitious and it's okay to have, have ambitious ideas, but truly, you know, and, and this is, this, this completely makes sense in some ways. Um, you know, the customers themselves are the ones who are best equipped to understand where the, where the problems are. We aren't, software vendors are not, we are not best equipped to answer the question, of you know uh, what is the biggest uh, problem at an oil and gas uh, operation, or what is the biggest problem in a bank? We're, I'm not a banker. I'm not. I don't work in the oil and gas industry. I build software with a whole bunch of really talented people. Um, but if you're engaged with them in a in a in a continuous uh, cycle and a continuous feedback loop and getting that constant feedback on what you've delivered, um, you're you know you're going to end up solving the problems that mean the most for those users. Because when you go into an organization, everybody's looking at their data lake and bringing in their master data model because they they know that AI is the future and we need more data. And then the rightfully so, the data scientists saying, your data is yeah. terrible. What do you expect me to do with this? Right. And then uh, the problem gets flipped on them saying, hey, you guys told us that you can change our world. Go rock our world. Go right. get the data. So they're forced begrudgingly <laughs> to go off and try to do AI on documents in these things. And it is, it's actually tough when yeah. Davey and Jason come in and talk to them and say, we're going to give you this whole visualization content. Our AI is not actually going to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. It's not going to solve the oil and gas predictability problem. It's not going to solve your maintenance and asset management optimization no offense. We're not going to get you to the finish line, but we will get you to the start line. Yeah. Everything that we've done, all this massively scalable search across all the data is going to have insights and, and classification and all of the stuff that is hard for you right now, but you can hit it as a REST API or a SQL query and you can use your Power BI or whatever right. else that you want to do. Then you can start building up your own data models. You can start then building up your predictive components from this data. So we're just gonna, we're gonna level you up. But the hard part is of the conversation is letting them know, we're not gonna get you over the finish line. And that's where I, we're doing this right now with customers, but it's, that is a kind of a funny sticking point because they're hoping is like, I'm in a tough spot here, I gotta deliver. Yeah. Can't you just do this for me? And I'm like, no, you guys know everything about this industry. Yeah. All we can do is show you what, what all of your data is, and then you need to go pick that up and, and do your data models. Yeah, and, and every, every uh, enterprise customer out there is at uh, different stages of maturity and sophistication on that. I mean, it, it runs the gamut, right? So, so I think, you know, you and I have both had lots of conversations over the years and, and recently with customers who are very sophisticated in their thinking in this area and they, they they're like yep got got it gonna run with it and then there are others that aren't and 
Um, and so, you know, one of the challenges is to, you know, and I think it is on us is to, to help those customers who are a little earlier on in that, in that journey um, become more aware of it. The companies that succeed and that are going to succeed over the course of the next 20, 30, 40 years are the companies that do embrace this, this um, transition to becoming not just a company that makes soda pop or uh, screws and nuts and bolts, but a company that embraces their data and, and, and works to understand that data and to, 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 to gain knowledge and understanding of their own data so that they can uh, more rapidly make better decisions than they have been without having that data understanding. It, it does remind me of a, a lovely circumstance of I was at a customer in their big lobby foyer and a gentleman came down and just started talking a little bit about who I didn't know. It's about the project that we were doing. Yeah. And, and the quote that they gave was, we are data rich and information poor. And right. see what, what you're doing with our company is transforming that. And they said, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. And as you walked away, I, I, uh, I asked our champion that was there with us, who was that? And he goes, yeah, that's the CEO, the CEO wow. of a very, yeah. very, very large company. Wow. One that saw our dashboards, one that used the software to solve a couple of problems yeah. and got it. And it was kind of powerful to, because they, they get it, big asset management kind of company. They, they, the thing that they produce is done by making sure that their assets are working very well. Sure. And, uh, and the fact that they're identifying very early that they need information to run their business. They need to optimize break fix. They need to optimize uh, their, their uh, supply chain and other issues. And then, of course, the day-to-day -day operations as well. And they're going to do that with information, not just stuff on a file share or just stuff in an ECM system or whatever. That's It needs yeah. to be delivered to the right person at the right time and disposed of at the right time. That whole information paradigm that that needs to go across all of the content sources. I, I, do, I, do, I do believe that the companies that figure this out are going to be in an at an advantage if they aren't already. And the companies that don't are going to be in trouble. There's going to be a separation at some point or another where, you know, in each industry, um, in each vertical, uh, companies and organizations that have figured this out are going to start to pull away. And the companies that haven't are going to stay right where they are. The world doesn't need good ideas. The good ideas are out there. We come up with good ideas all the time, but the world needs a path to implement good ideas. All the ideas are already out there. If you read popular mechanics or whatever, it, somebody's thought of these things. And like, I didn't yeah. have the idea of using AI and high-speed search technology and other things to understand all your content. Yeah. We just, in, we invented a strategy to actually get it deployed and carve up and, and demonstrate the value in, of the understanding, which is way bigger than the idea the how and the confidence to deploy trump the there's no efficacy in an idea yeah the the how the how and the confidence man you just you just hit the nail on the head because uh, you know we we've heard it again and again from from our customers i've i've been hearing it for 25 years people people want help in this area they you know uh, they they want guidance they want to trust uh, the people that they're working with because they aren't necessarily subject matter experts in this, in this way of thinking. And they don't, and, and maybe they don't entirely want to be, like I said earlier, you know, they, they want to focus on their stuff. You know, I, I had a customer uh, years ago who uh, their big thing was potatoes. Potato, like uh, they had some crazy stat that, you know, if you're in a restaurant in the States and you're having French fries, there's something like a 92% chance that it was one of their potatoes. And then, you know, and I, I was working with the IT department and the, and the CIO's office and, and the like, and, you know, that they were all about the potatoes. They had potatoes at lunch, potatoes at dinner, and that was really important to them, even though they were IT people. And, you know, when you come into those situations, they don't necessarily say to, to, to us, you know, 
I want to go on a, an, a, a, an EIM or ECM journey. They have a set of problems that they want to solve and they want help doing it because they don't feel like they're the subject matter experts. So to your point. Yeah, it is. Makes yeah. me want to have French fries for lunch though now. Giving them a journey is the more powerful thing because yeah. it's, yeah, they already have the ideas. Right. And yeah. Yeah, it does make me want to have a crispy French fry. Sorry about that. That's okay. At least we're not talking about butter tarts. That would be that. Would oh yeah, the edge. That, that's another hour right there. Totally. Yeah, it was. Yeah. A great, it's always so fun chatting with you, Jason. I appreciate it very much and uh, taking time out of your day. And I hope you had a a, a good time too. Oh, geez, man. Yeah, it's great.